do please keep your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. You may see in the bulletin that the title for the sermon this morning, the message this morning, is The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And I shamelessly stole the title from this little book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, which despite its appearance, was published in 1648, written by Jeremiah Burroughs, one of the great English Puritans, one of the great preachers in England in the first half of the 1600s. And of course, the book is based on this passage, the rare jewel of Christian contentment. And it struck me for many years, I've probably had this book for 15 years now, the rare jewel, that phrase, the rare jewel of Christian contentment. I think it's at least my practical experience, and probably yours too, that contentment, even among Christians, can often be a rare thing. Think about yourself. Let me think about myself. Is real contentment in my life sometimes a rare jewel more than it's in abundance? Am I really, as Paul writes in this passage, content in every circumstance? Now, what Paul is doing in this paragraph is preparing to close the letter to the Philippian Christians with a word of thanks to them for a gift of money that they had sent to Paul, who is in prison in Rome, a gift of money that they, the Philippian Christians, had sent to Paul by the hand of one of the Philippian Christians named Epaphroditus. But before he thanks them for the gift, which he'll do in the next paragraph, Paul wants the Philippian Christians to know that whether he has their money or doesn't have their money, whether he's well or sick, whether he's out of prison and free to proclaim the gospel or in prison and not so free to proclaim the gospel, he's learned to be content in every circumstance. Now you'll notice in the passage, verses 10 to 13, Paul never commands you and me, be content as I'm content. But we don't get off that easily. Go back just to verse 9 of the passage, right before we began our reading today, where Paul writes, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So what you've heard from me, Paul says, what you've seen in me, practice these things. So we may not have a command, be content in all circumstances, but Paul's saying, this is my example, and the rest of you Christians should live according to the same example. So we want to see four truths this morning about the rare jewel of Christian contentment. Number one, what exactly is it? I'll hazard a definition of Christian contentment. Number two, why is it so important? Paul certainly thought it was important. It was one of the last things that he thought he had on his heart to write to the Philippians about. Why is it important? Number three, what is the basis for Christian contentment? And then number four, how is it possible for sinful human beings like me and like you genuinely to experience real, true Christian contentment? So those are the four questions we'll seek to answer, the four truths we'll try to bring out from this passage this morning. So number one, what does Christian contentment look like? What exactly is it? 
Well, in trying to answer those questions, I think it's important to see that in verse 10, Paul begins with a word of rejoicing. Many of us call Philippians Paul's letter of joy. He sounds the note of joy more frequently in Philippians than any other letter that we have from him in the New Testament. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have re revived your concern for me. You've been able to send another gift to me this time of money. Or we go back to verse 4 of chapter 4, very famous, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Now verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, sounds a lot like to me what Paul's saying here. Be content in every circumstance. So I take rejoicing and contentment to be very close in Paul's mind and maybe even they're the same thing. Not quite sure. But for that reason, I want to offer you this description or this definition of Christian contentment. And it's, it's very close to the one found in this. And this book is a, a little jewel as well, in addition to having the word jewel in the title. So let me offer this description, I think, of Christian contentment. It's a God-given ability to be at peace with and to rest in firm assurance of the goodness of God's will, no matter what our outward circumstances may be. I'll repeat that. I think because the idea of contentment occurs within the context, the larger context of Paul's statements about joy, I'll define Christian contentment as a God-given ability to be at peace with and to rest in firm assurance of the goodness of God's will, no matter what our outward circumstances may be. Now notice that in verse 9, which I read a moment ago, Paul says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Practice these things, including Christian contentment. Well, the Philippians, you may remember, had seen a pretty powerful example from Paul's own life of what Christian contentment, no matter what the circumstances, really looks like. You may remember that Paul came to Philippi originally with Silas. And for certain reasons, we don't need to go into this morning, they were arrested by the Roman authorities of the city. And they were beaten with rods. And I won't go into the gory details of such a beating, but suffice it to say, physically it was a vicious act. So Paul is beaten with rods. And then Acts 16 tells us, the Romans threw Silas and Paul into the inner prison. Now, I've visited in jail before, the state penitentiary, the county jail. Visited. Let me underline. Visited. <laughs> Didn't stay, thank the Lord. <laughs> visited. <laughs> Those who were struggling. And jail is a terrible place today. It's very depressing. But imagine what it must have been like in Roman times. How bad it smelled. And they're in the inner jail. It's dark. And then we're told in Acts 16, not only that, they put the feet of Paul and Silas in the stocks. And so they can't move. But then Acts tells us, what were Paul and Silas doing around midnight? Well, they were complaining, right? Lord, this is not fair. We're preaching the gospel. How could it be that we wind up in jail and not just jail? We're beaten up. We're here in the inner, inner prison. Our feet are in the stocks. Lord, this isn't fair. No, you're right. They were praying and singing hymns, we're told. 
Now that's Christian contentment. They had seen a vivid picture of resting in the goodness of God's will from Paul himself. My favorite painter is Rembrandt van Rijn. And Rembrandt painted several pictures. He had a long career. And the Apostle Paul was someone with whom he was fascinated. And he painted several very famous portraits of the Apostle Paul. In fact, one, he painted a self-portrait of Rembrandt himself as the Apostle Paul. Very interesting. But my favorite is this one, and I want to show it to you. I thought about sending a slide and putting it up on the screen, but it was, it was too late, so I just brought it. This is from a museum in Stuttgart, and it's called, can you see this at all? It's called The Apostle Paul in Prison. Rembrandt painted it in 1627. The Apostle Paul in Prison. Now, the, the details I know are hard to see. What's interesting is he has a, a sword Rembrandt painted a sword into the picture. We're not quite sure. My guess is it's pretty clear that Paul, he has a pen in his hand or a stylus, so he's writing one of his letters. My guess is the sword represents Ephesians 6.17, the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, because Paul's writing the word of God, one of his letters. Just my guess. But what strikes you if you see this picture, and I encourage you maybe to Google it this afternoon from Google Images and look at it for yourself. It's pretty remarkable, is how peaceful Paul looks. Here he is. He's an old man. Uh, Rembrandt didn't tell us which imprisonment of Paul it was, but he's an old man, and he's in prison, but very clearly he's not worried. He's not consumed with anxiety. There's peace on his face, and he's deep in thought as he composes this letter, maybe to Timothy, maybe to one of the churches, maybe even the letter to the Philippians. And so the Philippians had an example they had been able to see from the Apostle Paul of Christian contentment, of what it means to rest, to be at peace, in the goodness of the will of God. So question number two, why is Christian contentment so important? We can surmise that as Paul gets to the end of the letter, he's writing about matters that he wants to make sure he doesn't forget to address to the Philippians. So this is a matter of importance to him. Why is Christian contentment so important. Two reasons. Number one, for the health, for the welfare of the soul of the individual Christian. Christian contentment is healthy for your soul. Just as exercise is healthy for your body, Christian contentment is healthy for your soul. What do I mean? This is the reason why I think Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, warns against worry. Do you remember what Jesus said? It's one of my favorite sayings of Jesus. He said, remember if you worry, you cannot add one single hour to your lifespan. The translation may be, you can't add a single inch to your height. Not only can you not add to your lifespan through worry, but modern medicine tells us that, in fact, more than likely, we actually shorten our lifespans through worry. Yet some of us, because of temperament, because of circumstances, are natural worriers, aren't we? Instead of living in contentment, we live in a constant, low-level 
or even high-level state of anxiety. We worry whether other people like us. We worry whether we'll have enough money to do what we need to be able to do over the next four years. We worry whether the United States will suffer a terrible terrorist attack or not. Jesus said, worry doesn't add an hour to your lifespan. Paul writes, instead, practice Christian contentment, a resting in the goodness of God's will, no matter what your outward circumstances. Now, Christian contentment is not, we need to be clear about this, it's not just optimism or mere optimism. It's not just a sunny disposition. It's got much deeper roots than that, as we'll see in just a moment. My favorite figure in American history is Abraham Lincoln. He's the person I most admire in the history of the United States. But you know that when you start to read about people you really admire, you find that they're not perfect, that they have clay feet. And on the morning that he was assassinated, April the 14th, 1865, Lincoln shared with his cabinet a dream he had had the night before. And you may know that Lincoln was very superstitious about dreams. And he believed that this particular dream actually forecast that something good was going to happen in his life. And of course he was killed that very evening. Christian contentment is not rooted in something as ephemeral as a dream. It's got much deeper, truer, real, rock solid foundation. Paul, when he calls us to be content, in this passage is not telling us to be like, do you remember the character Alfred E. Newman on the cover of Mad Magazine? Remember him? What would he say? What? Me worry? <laughs> Paul's not calling us to be Alfred E. Newman. It's much deeper, much truer, rock solid foundation. We'll see that in just a moment. But the point for now, Christian contentment is important because it's good for our souls. It's the opposite of worry, anxiety that eats away at our souls. Second reason, an even greater reason why Christian contentment is so important is it glorifies God. Christian contentment brings God glory. How? Well, look again carefully with me at verse 12 of the passage. Paul writes, I know how to be brought low. And if you go back to 2 Corinthians, I think it's 11, and that list that Paul writes that's so amazing, shipwrecks, beatings, in danger, hungry, Paul really did know what it meant to be bought, brought low. But he says, and I know how to abound. There I think he's talking about his childhood. He was born a Roman citizen, a rare privilege for a Jew, which when he grew up in Jerusalem where he was trained under some of the best teachers in Judaism. So I'm thinking that Paul probably, as a young person, grew up in a fairly well-off Jewish family, a family that was able to educate him as well as a Jew could be educated in those days. So he knows how to abound. He knows how to be brought low. And he's learned how to be content in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. So how does that glorify God? If you have all the money that you really need, and you have good health, 
and your circumstances, generally speaking, are okay, then you glorify God by being content in those circumstances because Christian contentment, remember, is a resting in the goodness of God's will. And what you say to the world is, I'm content not because I've got enough money, although I'm thankful for that. I'm not content because I've got good health, though I'm thankful for that. I'm not ultimately content because my circumstances are peaceful, though I'm thankful for that too. Ultimately, I'm content because of all that God is for me in Jesus Christ. And supremely, because I know that God's will for me in all circumstances is good. And so when you have much and your health is good and your circumstances are okay, it glorifies God when you show the world that my contentment is not ultimately in that, though I'm thankful for it. My contentment is in God and who he is for me in Jesus Christ. But it's even more true that we glorify God if our circumstances aren't rosy. If I'm battling a serious illness, if I'm struggling financially, if I'm suffering for some other reason, and I'm still content, what I'm saying into the world is Contentment can't be fa- can be found even despite those circumstances. That when our contentment, our resting, our peace is found supremely in the Lord and who he is for us in Jesus Christ and the goodness of his will for our lives, when we show the world that, we show the world that God is the great treasure and not money or good health or peaceful circumstances, or anything else. But God is the great treasure. The Christian ministry desiring God, I think, puts it right when it says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. When we're most content in God, and the world can see that, then God is greatly glorified in our lives. Whether we have much, whether we have little, whether we have good health or poor health, whether our circumstances are peaceful or whether our circumstances are very rocky at the moment. If our contentment is rooted in God and who he is for us in Jesus Christ, in the goodness of his will, he will be greatly glorified in those circumstances. So on to question number three. What is the source for Christian contentment? This is what I was alluding to earlier. Christian contentment is not built on dreams or circumstances or a sunny disposition or a naturally optimistic outlook. It's built on solid rock. And what is that solid rock? I don't think we really have to guess. Paul doesn't say explicitly here, but surely it's the goodness of God's will. Let me repeat my definition. Christian contentment is a God-given ability to be at peace with and to rest in firm assurance of the goodness of God's will no matter what our outward circumstances may be. In other words, though Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians from jail in Rome, he's confident of what he had written in Romans 8, 28. That in all things, in all things, God is at work for those who love him, who are the called according to his purposes for Christians. God is at work in and through all circumstances for our good. Now that's God's definition of good and not mine, and that's an important point. 
But I think that's where Paul found his contentment. Was though he was in prison in Rome, and though he was dependent upon others like the Philippians, you may know that in, in, um, under the Roman government, if you were in prison, you had to pay for your meals. They weren't supplied by the Roman Empire. Your family either, <coughs> pardon me, had to bring you food or pay for it so that it would be provided for. So Paul needed the money. Even though he was in jail, he needed the money to be able to eat. And so he's dependent upon others for his very food. And yet Paul says, I'm content. And I think that contentment was rooted in the solid rock of the goodness of God's will for Paul's life. And our contentment will be solid and true and real when likewise it's rooted in in the assurance of God's, the goodness of God's will for our lives. But if you think of that, of the goodness of God's will as a root, it goes even deeper than that. The goodness of God's will is based on two even more fundamental truths. God's will for us is good, but even that has a basis. And truth number one on which the goodness of God's will is based is the goodness of God himself. God's will is good because God is good. Isn't that about the most fundamental thing we can say about God? How many times does the Bible say it? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. If we ever begin to doubt the goodness of God, we go back to Calvary, where we see God in human flesh, the Son of God, dying to pay the penalty for the sins of sinners, receiving upon himself the just wrath of God not against his sins, he had no sin, against our sins. And suffering in his soul the just wrath of the Father against our sins because of his love for the glory of God and his love for us, and his love for us individually, his love for you individually, his love for me individually. The cross is the supreme display of the love of God. The cross is the supreme display of the goodness of God. God's will is good because God is good. Now there are times in life, I think all of our lives, when like Job, we question the goodness of God. Our circumstances can be so hard sometimes, that we look up to heaven and we say, God, how can this possibly, this circumstance possibly come from a good God like you? How can your will possibly be good in these circumstances? It's in times like those, and I'm quick to complain myself, that I like to remember a little stanza from an old hymn by William Cooper. Do you know his name? Who wrote a hymn, it's a wonderful hymn, called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. But the stanza I like the best goes this way. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, that is, with your own human understanding. But trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, there hides a smiling face. Don't you love that? Behind a frowning providence, a difficult circumstance in your life, there hides a smiling face. 
the goodness of God is still there. It's like a cloudy day like today. We know the sun is up there, right? Somewhere. <laughs> somewhere the sun is up there. And somewhere the sun, it, it's shining. We know that. Despite the clouds. And sometimes life is like that. It's cloudy. And God says, you know that the sun is still there. You know that I'm still good. And so God's will is good because God is good. But second, our Christian contentment is based on the rock-solid reality that God's will is good because God is good and also because God is all-powerful. What if God were good but not all-powerful? He would not be able to bring his goodness to pass in the world. Some of you remember Rabbi Harold Kushner's best-selling book about 25 years ago titled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Rabbi Kushner was struggling with the death of his own son. And he came to the conclusion that God is good, he's just not all-powerful. And that's why Rabbi Kushner's son died. What a tragedy. The Bible declares of God that from him and through him and to him are all things. All things means all things. From him, through him, to him, all things. Psalm 115, verse 3. Our Lord is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. God has all power. And so we can be content because we know that God's will for us, if we're Christians, is always good. God's definition of good, yes, not mine. But God's will is always good because God himself is good and because God has all power to bring his will to pass in our lives and in the world. And so Christian contentment doesn't rest on sand. Do you know what Stone Mountain is? Stone Mountain is an exposed piece of granite out, just outside the city of Atlanta where I grew up that's about 500, 700 feet high. 700 feet of solid granite. And Stone Mountain actually runs underground all the way to North Carolina. That is a massive piece of stone. Standing on being, practicing Christian contentment is like standing on the top of Stone Mountain. That's how firm it is because it's based on the goodness of God's will for us, which is in turn based on God's own goodness and the reality that he has all power to bring his will to pass. So fourth and final question. Well, I'm a sinner, or I'm just naturally given to the sin of worry, the sin of anxiety. How in the world since it's so hard for me to be content, might I be able also to find Christian contentment the way that Paul talks about it here? Here the key is verse 13, where Paul writes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now that verse may be on a plaque somewhere in your house, maybe in a wall hanging of some kind. We use it for all kinds of circumstances. And I don't think that's wrong at all. But just remember that the original context for the promise or the truth, I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me, the original context is Christian contentment. In the original context, Paul is saying, I can be content no matter what my outward circumstances are, 
because of Christ who gives me the strength, the ability to be content. When, by God's grace, a sinner trusts in Jesus alone to save him or her from sin and to give eternal life, the faith with which we trust Jesus for salvation is a faith that joins us spiritually to Jesus so that, the New Testament says, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And Christ is in us for a thousand different reasons. But one reason Christ lives in us spiritually is to communicate to your human spirit his own contentment. Remember that even at the cross where Jesus was in such anguish because he was experiencing the wrath of the Father, nevertheless, he went there for the joy that was set before him. There was an underlying contentment for Jesus in knowing that the Father's will was good even at the cross. And that Jesus lives in you and me. So the more we ask Jesus, Jesus, give me your own contentment. The more we see his contentment revealed in Scripture, the more we ourselves will find ourselves becoming content, able to rest in the goodness of God's will no matter what our circumstances. So we've seen this morning what Christian contentment looks like, why it's so important for our, the welfare of our souls, for God's glory. What is the source of Christian contentment? The goodness of God's will based on his goodness and the reality that he's all-powerful. How we can have Christian contentment through Christ who strengthens us, who lives in us spiritually. I want to close this morning with an illustration of Christian contentment from our own time. And I've mentioned this person before to you, and several of you said you know her well, and I think you've even read this book, Johnny Erickson Tata's A Place of Healing, which I commend as highly as I can to you. In fact, if I remember, it's on the bookshelf um, back there in the library. And Johnny, as, as all of you know, was... Uh, paralyzed in a diving accident when she was 16 years old. She's about 65, so that's 46 years ago. And in recent years, in addition to the quadriplegia, she's developed chronic pain and breast cancer as well. So she's dealt with chronic pain and with chemotherapy treatments for the breast cancer. And this was written in the, in the wake of the diagnosis and the treatment of her breast cancer. It's probably because she knows the subject so well, the best book on suffering and finding contentment in the midst of it outside the Bible that I've ever read. And she writes this, and I'll, I'll close with her words. And she's reflecting here, by the way, on the very passage we've been studying this morning. She's reflecting on Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. And she writes, Thank you, God, for this life you have given me. Thank you for the many opportunities to serve you, even in my pain. Thank you, God, for this wheelchair. For it has been granted to me not only to believe on your son, but to suffer for his sake. Oh, joy. As I have stated in the pages of this book, so many have tried to get me to say that my accident 43 years ago was never part of God's plan that my paralysis was never his intention, that quadriplegia was never necessary, that chronic pain did not have to be, that suffering was never part of God's plan, that the many tears and groans and struggles and sleepless nights were needless and a waste of my energy and my life. I know differently. It was all planned long ago, and God brought it about in his perfect faithfulness, in the goodness of his will. 
And because he allowed it and permitted it, because he has walked with me through every moment of it, his plan has been marvelous for Johnny Erickson Tata. And let me add this. I mean these words as much as I have ever meant any words. I am content to the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of Johnny Erickson Tata, who can suffer so much more, Lord, than I ever have even perhaps dreamed of suffering, and yet can say and mean with all her heart and know it to be true, that she is content. And she's content through Christ who gives her strength, the strength to continue to rest in the reality that your will, God, is good in all things, even in paralysis, even in a wheelchair. Thank you, Lord, for the example of the Apostle Paul who could sing even when he was in jail sing hymns of praise to you. And thank you for the example of Jesus, who could do no less than endure your wrath for our sins. And yet, in the middle of his anguish, have an underlying contentment, even joy, in the knowledge that even in that suffering, infinite suffering, your will for him, the Son, was good. We thank you, Lord. Shape us, shape us for our welfare and for your glory into the sort of people who truly would be able to say with Paul that if we have plenty, we're content. If we don't have anything but you, we're content. Thank you, Lord. We pray for these mercies. In Jesus' name, amen.